Hello and welcome to the Football English podcast in collaboration with World Football Index, a unique mix of fandom and journalism. Footvay English is your one-stop shop for all things Venezuelan football in the English language, from the men's to the women's and the domestic leagues to the national teams. We are at the halfway point of the Liga Footvay 2023 season. 14 games have been played by all clubs across 15 game weeks and the league is currently on its four-week break. Here to discuss the first half of the season with me is Footvay English regular co-host Dominic Bassonio. Dominic, how are you? I'm very good and I'm very excited to talk about the season so far. It's been a, a really interesting, unexpected twist and turn journey and uh, it's been really great covering it. Yeah, and I think in contrast to the past couple of seasons, uh, it's been a lot harder to follow the league uh, with the, the change in the TV broadcasting rights, fewer games being streamed uh, on YouTube, Gold TV becoming a little less accessible and ultimately the lack of coverage on Instat and Wisecap. But on the flip side, for people like you and I, Kevin, and people inside Venezuelan football, I think it's put an extra pressure on us to be even more aware and focus more intently because it's far harder to, to look back. And if you miss a performance, there's not like, oh, let's go see how that player did by looking at the numbers. How have you found the first half of the season, following it, not just as a fan, but as, as someone sort of collating what's going on for the public through Football English? Yeah, it's interesting. You, the, the, the list you provided there, those are all very valid reasons that I think everybody, including us, you know, I think we've probably seen less of the minute by minute of this season than maybe years past. And, and we've had to often take turns more so with, with coverage more than maybe years past. Um, and, and there, there is a downside to that. Uh, that being said, the season itself, I've really enjoyed. There's been just some really remarkable performances, some really entertaining games. Um, and, and so I, 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 I would love a, a world where everybody could access everything. Um, and, and maybe that's something that's down the line somewhere. But uh, for what it's worth, the, the product that people are getting, I, I think, has been really fun this year. So... Um, I, I found it really entertaining. Um, I, I do miss the days of, of everything just being on YouTube and, and all that sort of stuff, but obviously that's not how the world works. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, I've had a lot of fun uh, watching the season uh, given some of the, the barriers that are there. And from the very start of the season, we've had a league, league, a league leader, sorry, that not only raced into an early lead, but maintained and built upon it almost game after game. And that is Academia Portugal. Safe to say, hands down, the revelation of the season based on the increase of their performance uh, from, from last season to this and even two seasons ago to now. But not overly a surprise considering who they brought in as head coach and the quality of players that they brought in. What can you, what can you tell us about Portugal first six months of 2023? They've been pretty remarkable. Uh, in lead play, that the team has been near perfect. Their their current record, as a recording, is is eleven wins, two draws, and one loss. Uh, they they've played exciting soccer a lot of the time, football. Excuse me. Uh, they've uh, brought in, like you said, several players that are close to Chita San Vicente. They've also used the best of the players that are already there. For example, a star like Luis Fer, uh, Hernandez, who of course was already at the club for several years. Uh, and really just top to bottom, for, uh, really, again, from Hernandez, who's this young forward, to, uh, you know, a goalkeeper like Romero, who's this more experienced piece they've brought in. They, they've they really just brought the most out of each player, it feels like, uh, playing really entertaining football, getting into the group stage of, uh, of uh, for the first time, of international football as well. Uh, just really giving the club an amazing season. And anyway, it's interesting, and you mentioned, of course, the dominance they've shown. It really makes it last season feel like when San Vicente, of course, was at Samora, returning to Samora, and they had a, a very dominant regular season. Uh, it almost look, makes that season look like a prototype to what they're accomplishing this season. This season looks, I mean, far and ahead, even more dominant, even more clean than Samora did last year with some of the same players, by the way, uh, as this current squad at, at Academia Puerto Cabello. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just been a, a really impressive year. 
I think everyone expected them to do well with San Vicente in charge, but I'm not sure that I ever <laughs> thought that they would uh, be such far and ahead of everybody else. Uh, yeah, it, it's been a really uh, uh, admirable start. And yesterday, League of Football's official Twitter account posted a really interesting uh, graphic, thanks to their new data um, partnership with Stats Perform, which we've spoken about on at least two podcasts prior to today, so we won't really go into too much about it today. Um, but the graphic was very insightful. Academia Protocol Bay, head and shoulders at the top of the table. Their points difference between themselves and Tatra in second is, is nine. Um, and after 14 games, you know, that's a, a pretty nice cushion. The graphic was insightful for and interesting for, for me for two main reasons. Firstly, Academia Protocolo um, have the most direct style of football in the league you could interpret from this data. The, um, the metres per second that they advance the ball up the pitch uh, is the quickest um, at around 2.2. And interestingly, by their average uh, passes per possession, they're in the bottom three or four teams in the league. They're the only team below the average for passes per possession that are in not just the top four of the table, but the top half of the table. The only team below the average in the top half. So they're playing a very direct style of football, but also they lose possession pretty regularly. They're only, well, they're averaging under four passes per possession. So for them, and again, no real surprise to anyone familiar with Chita San Vicente's football, at least in recent years, very direct very vertical, not afraid to lose the ball, not afraid to play a game full of transitions. The other teams around them in terms of, of you know, lower end passes per possession are Uceve, Mineros, Zamora, Rayo Zuliano, all the teams struggling around the bottom, plus Monagas, who, interestingly, going into the mid-season break are as low as ninth, and we're talking about the current sub campeones, the current runners-up of the league, um, and Angostura, who... I think we'll talk about next. Angostura. Academia, maybe a revelation. Angostura, a surprise? Uh, yeah, you know, their current table position is more or less in the area. I think we both saw them competing for that sort of right in the middle. But I, what I will say is it, it's more... What's surprising is kind of the way they've gone there. Um, Angostura had, you know, a really good start to the season. Uh, they, they did tail off a little bit and have recovered since then, again, getting a couple of wins recently. Uh, but they've played some really engaging football. They, they've really made the most out of young talent. Uh, and and they're, I think they're just playing a little more d dynamic, ambitious game than perhaps we were expecting. I think when they won League of Football 2 last season, they were looked at as sort of uh, uh, different from the Uceves and Hermanos's of uh, these sort of really entertaining second division teams that were going to break the mold. I think people saw them as a more traditional, perhaps uh, uh, more conservative lower division team coming up into League of Foot Bay. Uh, and, and I think they've broken that mold a little bit now that they're actually here. Uh, got some really big wins against good teams. They've, they've been incredibly competitive. They've been anything but a team to walk over. And, and yeah, I think you know, they're in eighth as we record. I think we mm -hmm. kind of expected them to be somewhere between eighth and 11th. Um, yeah, I just again, brought it up. We had them uh, at the start of the season, our thread on the 3rd of February. We had our prediction for them as ninth to 12th. Nice. So they okay. are outperforming us at the moment by, well, they're level on points with ninth. So they're outdoing us on goal difference. But uh, yeah, I think for me, it's the way they've done it. It's the way yeah. they've gotten to this place is really what's impressed me. So, yeah, I mean, a surprise in, in a slightly different way, but, yeah, a, a really great start to them. And they're, you know, to be clear, their first ever season in, in, in the first division as well. And one thing we did, I think, uh, predict accurately about Angostura's season is, as we do for every team at the beginning of the season, we put down who we think their young star is going to be. Before I say who we said, shout out to Aldri Contreras, only 18 years old. Um, and he's had a fantastic first half of the season for them. He's one of just two 2004-born players to have been selected in League of Football's Team of the Week on more than one occasion. But the young star of the season uh, that we put down, and I think is fulfilling uh, our prophecy, if you like, is Glyca Mendoza. Um, as of a couple of, of weeks ago, I think at the end of game week 13, 
um, he was leading the tables um, for dribbles. He was, set, or foul suffered, sorry, leading the tables for foul suffered, second for dribbles, so indicative of a, a player that's very progressive, um, and also in the top 10 for shots at goal. Um, hasn't yet converted those shots in goal to a regular flow of goals, but you need to be in the position to shoot in the first place. And although we don't have access to the stats, I think his uh, his XG to G uh, would be pretty healthy this season. Moving away from Academia Puerto Cabo and Angostura, let's take a brief look at the top four and whether that's kind of what we expected at the start of the season. Puerto Cabo lead leaders, trailed by Deportivo Tatra in second, Carabobo in third and Caracas in fourth. What have you made of the race for the top four, as it were? Well, it's definitely taken some twists and turns already, right? There's a, a period of time where uh, Monogas looked quite good in that top four. I believe there's a long period of time where they were actually second to Academia Puerto Bay. Obviously, they've dropped off. Uh, the, the, the current top four that we have, I don't necessarily think it surprises uh, either of us in the sense that it, there's nothing baffling about it. But I do think mm. that... Uh, Caro Bobo, I think, are maybe slightly outperforming what we expected this season, just in that they've they've been a little extra competitive, um, and, and they've had some signings that have really come 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 up good for them. Uh, Tatira and Caracas, I think we both thought were going to be in the mix. I think uh, to the point of of some of the recent statistics that you've been talking about, I think those reflect very interestingly on Tatira, which maybe you can go into more. But uh, yeah, I, I think these teams are all sort of the ones that we thought were going to be in the mix. Uh, I think Monogas have, have dropped off quite a bit. I think they maybe would be a team that I would have thought would be there instead of Carabobo, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but I, I think it's been a very competitive top four, despite the fact that first place obviously has quite a gap. Um, and it's been really interesting to see the, the flows of this. Caracas, for example, a team that started not necessarily great, albeit they weren't necessarily losing a lot, but they were drawing a lot. Uh, they've kind of grown into that top four. So it's already been interesting to see some of those twists and turns uh, Portuguesa, a team that spent a couple weeks in the top four. Uh, Metro, a team that's really trying to get into the top four, very close to doing so. So, uh, yeah, you know, I have a feeling this top four is actually going to look di very different by the end of the season, uh, just because of how uh, fluid it's been. But, uh, but yeah, I've been really impressed by by Tachira Carabobo and Caracas so far. I, I think they've done a very good job of of putting together a competitive season, of of making me feel like they have a chance at competing mm -hmm. with. Uh, Puerto Cabello, uh, some of them have not played each other, uh, you know, well, no one's played each other twice yet. So, you know, there's still room to grow there. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's been a really entertaining race so far for those positions. Yeah, and to pick up on a couple of, of points that you you highlighted well there. Um, firstly, Monagos, uh, as I said, then they're as low down as ninth, surprisingly, not in the top half of the table at all, and due to a format change this season, although never say never with last-minute changes in Liga Football, they wouldn't even be qualifying for the Sudamericana playoffs um, at the end of the season. They've won one in their last eight league games, and that one win was Academia Puerto Cabello's only defeat of the season. Right. Monagas came from behind um, to beat Academia Puerto Cabello 3-2 in, in Maturin, and that game saw the not emergence, but the the headline performance of young Leandro Rodriguez, 2005 born, who scored a, a two minute brace to turn the game on its head. Their most recent three games, one I guess, they have failed to score in a two nil home loss to Metropolitanos, a one nil away loss to Real Zuliano, probably safe to say a surprise, and in their most recent game, again a home defeat two nil to Caracas. No goals in in three games, not as surprising. At as it may sound for the subcampeones, Abdiel Arroyo uh, is a, a striker that I have made no <laughs> no uh, attempt to hide my dislike for. I really don't think he has the the level anymore, um, at particularly the level that we require of foreign players to come in and make a difference this season. And maybe we'll touch upon the level of foreigners in the league later in the podcast. And Basante, who is as raw um, and as potential filled as you may like from a young striker in Liga Football, but... You know, he's under 20. This is still only his second season at top flight level, heavily rotated last season. Probably going to be a top league of football player in the future, um, but is still bidding in. It, a steady flow of goals is very much what Managas need in the second half of the season. They have only scored 14 uh, in 14 games. Only, only Portuguesa with 13 um, have scored fewer 
uh, in the, the top 10 of the season, uh, top 10 of the table, sorry. And in general, the only other two teams that have scored fewer than them are Mineros with 12, rock bottom of the league, Richard Blanco at the age of 41 with exactly half those goals at six, and Uceve uh, with 10 goals. So not looking great for Managas, but last week the club itself did issue one of those uh, football manager-esque style we are with you letters about Johnny Ferreira, their head coach, the longest head co- ser- sorry, longest serving head coach in Liga Football as it stands. Picking up on another good point you made, Caracas. They too, like Puerto Cabello, have only lost one game um, this season, but 12 points separate them due to Caracas drawing eight games and eight being a league high. They've drawn eight of 14 games, many of which came at home as well. And interestingly, the only two games Caracas have lost this season, one in the league and one in Copa Sudamericana, have both come against Puerto Cabello and both come thanks to uh, Loifa Hernandez goals. So Cheetah San Vicente really being a thorn in his ex side this season. What I wanted to talk about next, though, is outside the race for the top four, which after the 30 game season will break away into a championship stage to decide the winner, is what happens after that. In the past season or two, fifth to 12th have broken off after 30 games into two groups of four. And the top two from each group then enter the Sudamericana playoffs. This season, as it stands, that is not happening. It will simply be 5th, 6th, 7th and 8th that will qualify for the Copa Sudamericana playoffs at the start of next year. So 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th, four positions in the table that last year would have given you a shot at Sudamericana are this year essentially meaningless. And like I said, Monagas are currently although only the midpoint outside of those positions, as are Estudiantes, who are in the Sudamericana group stages this year, and Zamora, who was in the um, Libertadores playoffs this year. So it is a big case in point. So, Dominic, where would you like to take this podcast next? Well, I, I, I do think that there's some interesting things happening in terms of the bottom of the table. Uh, I, I do think that the, I mean, it's too early to quite call a relegation battle yet, uh, but the brewing relegation battle for the second half of the season, I, I think is an interesting one right now, particularly with Uceve and Mineros basically as being the protagonists of that. Uh, so Mora and, and uh, Reo Zuliano kind of on the, on the verge of it. Um, it, it. I think it's interesting because, you know, Uceve obviously uh, started the year quite, quite poorly, I think it's fair to say. Uh, they were bottom mm-hmm. for quite a long period of time. Mineros are currently bottom as we record with with eight uh, eight points. Uceve with eleven, uh, and that that twist, uh, which to some degree has has been parallel with the the return of uh, Sasso as as manager of Uceve, uh, has been a really interesting one to watch. Uh, you know, Mineros is a team that I think has a lot of young talent on it. You've mentioned already Richard Blanco, who of course is 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 a a bit of a legend for this league and has continued actually to be quite good this season despite his age, which is basically what we say every year, um, and, and has been quite good for them, gotten them uh, a few very important goals and some important points. Uh, it, it does seem, however, like Mineros can't quite figure out how to put those pieces together uh, to, to get results, which is what Uceve looked like, I think, the first part of the year, and, they, and they've sort of started to solve that that puzzle. So, um, yeah, for me, it's really interesting to, to see this relegation battle, to see Zamora so close to it, uh, to see Zuliano uh, certainly part of it, although maybe less a part of it. I, I, what's interesting to me about Rayo Zuliano this year is that they are certainly close to the relegation zone, but they don't feel like a team that's going to get relegated to me. They just seem like a team that's going to float right above that. Yeah. Um, and so, again, those sort of four teams... I know Hermanos are kind of close to that crowd as well, but it's really those four teams to me that feel like they're in that conversation right now. Um, I, I think it's just played out to be a very interesting sort of back and forth between all of them. Yeah, I think the thing with Reyes Juliano is, um, although they are down there, their their performances and particularly a few of their results, for example, beating Monagas 1-0, um, they have what they have, I think, enough in the tank to, to stay up. They've got quite a few exciting um, young players like Colina, for example, who did well at the um, under-17 Sudamericano, got a goal against Argentina. Um, and a couple of the players that have come across with them from from Zulia, for example, Jesus Paz, uh, Adrian Montañez, the, the giant centre-back who's, you know, worked his way into the team now and is starting again, uh, starting alongside, sorry, Luis Parra 
a very capable uh, centre back and the captain of the team. And then, um, sorry, I merged into Angostura there. Yeah. Me. Um, <laughs> going back to Ray Zuliano. Uh, yes, Colina, exciting. And then at the back, sorry, the experience. What I meant to say is Valdez, um, their their goalie. Uh, separate separate from their um, new league of football compatriots, Angostura, who were the other team promoted. I'll add Angostura winning and Ray Zuliano buying their way in to the top flight to um, replace Zulia. Aside from the league, we've also had a bit of uh, continental and international action. Um, we'll get the, the bad news out of the way first, if you like. So we'll talk about Copa Libertadores and Sudamericana. In the group stages of Libertadores, <clears throat> we have Monagas, who, to be fair to them, have put in some good performances, but just haven't been able to get uh, wins across the line, which was the story in their last game. Um, and again, they're struggling for a consistent uh, source of goals. And joining them in the Copa Libertadores, making their competition debut, Metropolitanos, 2022's Liga Football champions, both winless. And in Copa Sudamericana, we've got Academia Puerto Cabello, who are storming the league, but struggling uh, in the Sudamericana group stages, alongside Estudiantes de Merida, who I don't think it's a surprise to anyone um, are struggling this year. Uh, it was almost a, a minor miracle in themselves, in itself, sorry, that they managed to beat Deportivo Tatra to get the group stage position in the first place, beating them on penalties after a late equaliser. However, as always, when I'm negative, Dominic normally has some positives to bring <laughs> to the surface. Are there any positives from the Libertadores and Sudamericana campaigns this year? Well... Uh, you know, the, the obvious, very brief positive for, for clubs like Metro and Puerto Cabello is simply the matter of making history for, the, for their clubs, obviously reaching this stage. That, that mm -hmm. of course, is something to, to celebrate for them. Uh, I, what I would say, this is particularly with uh, Estudiantes and Monagas, whose league form has particularly dropped off since the group stage of the competition started, uh, whereas I would say Metro and Puerto Cabello hasn't particularly. Uh, the, uh, what I would say is the silver lining for Monodas and, and Estudiantes is that these group stages will be done soon. And when they are, I think they're going to probably get at least a mild bump in their league form. Um, I, I think, you know, particularly Monodas, who I think is, I, I would say seem like they're a little more uh, together uh, than Estudiantes in terms of game-to-game -game performances. They've gotten some some good draws at the very least in the Libertadores this year. Um I think as soon as they aren't having to play these games, they will probably be much more competitive for at least those Sudamericana spots. Um, and so, you know, for them, I, I think that's, I mean, the club I'm sure will, will want to try and get that third spot in their Libertadores group again, the Sudamericana. But uh, more realistically, I would say that the, the, the big thing to look forward to is having fresh legs again to focus on league play. Estudiantes, I think, also will benefit from that to some degree. Four teams have been really rough. Uh, I don't necessarily think there's a, a huge positive from open play at uh, you know at least for any of these four teams. I will say that again from Metro and Puerto Cabello, you have that history piece that is important to those younger teams. Uh, for Monagas and Estudiantes, I think it's a matter of hey, this is a good experience for Monagas. You get some memorable draws. You play Boca Juniors at home and, and have a big game there, a huge crowd. But at the end of the day, it's kind of about, all right, well, we're going to have to move on from this and focus on league play again and, and maybe get some more points. Um, so it's unfortunate that that's the tone that we have to talk about this campaign. Obviously, there's been years past where it's been a little more positive and exciting. But uh, I think that's just the reality of how it's played out. Yeah, and I think I, I do have a, a positive to bring to the table as well. And it's a, a nice little segue into what we discuss next. Um, and that is David Martinez, 17-year-old David Martinez, who um, becomes the youngest Venezuelan to score in the competition and also got an assist last week. So already has a goal and an assist in the Copa Libertadores this year, 17 um, years old. And when he scored his goal, I don't know if it's changed since. I, I suggest it probably hasn't. But when he scored his goal, um, I think he became the youngest goal scorer in the Copa Libertadores this year in general. He only turned 17 in February. Um, so it will be a hard to beat number in general. And as I said, perfect way to bridge into probably the last topic or penultimate topic of today's discussion. And that is the 
youth national team of Venezuela or teams, shall we say. They've played the under-20 Sudamericana, uh, Sudamericana, no, sorry, already this year, and the under-17s. And then next week, we have the Toulon tournament beginning and later in the year, the under-17 World Cup, which uh, Jamitos qualified for by finishing fourth in the under-17 Sudamericano a month or two ago. And the star of that team was unquestionably David Martinez. Out of the two tournaments, obviously we qualified for the World Cup on one and narrowly missed out on the other, but we reached the final stage of both. Which generation are you more excited, more excited about? For me, um, I think it's still too early to tell with the under-17s, um, how they're looking in three years. Uh, and the under 20s, quite a lot of people were disappointed with the performances. But what I took from it is firstly, we still very nearly qualified for the World Cup. And to finish top four in Combable is not easy when you've got Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, Uruguay, Paraguay, Bolivia, Chile, Peru. Like it's a very difficult federation. And secondly, I didn't really blame the players too much for how things went. We we set up negatively the head coach, Colacini's, you know, no longer with us. What did you make of the tournaments? I, you know, look, I think it's fair to say you're somewhat disappointed with with the the U20 result. I mean, yes, it didn't go uh, wonderfully. Uh, I, I would say to your question of, you know, like which age group am I kind of still looking at? I, I think this U10 group is really good. I think they had a really bad tournament, but I think that, or not even really bad tournaments, probably harsh to be honest, but they, they had a, a rough tournament. I still think there's a ton of talent in it. I'm very curious to see who can step up in the Toulon tournament, uh, which I think is a great opportunity to sort of refresh the conversation about uh, of this age group, give them another chance to perform at a high level. The U17s, very exciting. Uh, David Martinez looks like an absolute hell of a player. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to any opportunity between the two tournaments that, that he gets. Uh, and to make any form of the World Cup, I think, is a big deal. So I think both achievements are wonderful, but I do think the U20s deserve excitement still. I know that they had a rough tournament, but I think there's aspects of that tournament that people are a little harsh about. I mean, I, you know, people talk about how they, you know, they had to sort of barely make it out of the first stage, but they actually got more points out of the first stage of the tournament this year than the, the, the 2017 group did. Oh wow! Uh, I didn't know. Well, wow, that is a that's in, that's a great uh, fact. <laughs> I, I, I just I just wanted to double check this because I remember thinking, the 2017 group in the Sudamericana uh -huh. in the first stage they got through with four draws. They got four points from four uh -huh. draws. They didn't win a game. So wow! <laughs> I didn't so, know, I didn't realize that one. So, you know, there's that. little things like that. There's little things yeah. like that that you go well. And they went on of, to be the World Cup runners up. Exactly. A little bit of luck here, a little bit of fate there. You know, how close was this group to potentially actually looking a lot better than they, they looked because mm -hmm. they didn't make it to the World Cup uh, and because there were some tough results in there. So, yeah. you know, I, I think the margins have been really um, harsh on, on this group. I think there's a lot of talent. I mean, we're talking about guys, by the way, that are playing in good leagues and good levels around the world right now. Uh, it's not mm -hmm. even a matter of our opinion. It's, it's a matter of the fact that actual clubs clearly rate them. Um, so, again, I think the Toulon tournament is going to be a really great opportunity for those guys to have another chance to, to show themselves at a, a similar level to the world uh, against some really interesting opposition. Um, and so I, I'm really happy that that's going to be taking place and give those guys a chance. So, I mean, really, I think both tournaments are, are going to be must-watches for, for Venezuelan football, um, obviously, through this year. Yeah, and to point out, from the, you know, the under-20 um, Sudamericano, uh, you know, we talked about the disappointment of of not qualifying, but the under-20 World Cup is currently underway. Uh, the group stages are over. And in the two, four, six, eight, in the final 16 teams, I shouldn't have needed to calculate that. In the final 16 teams, five of them are South American. Five South Americans are in the final 16, practically a third. You've got Uruguay, you have Brazil, you have Colombia, you have Ecuador and you have hosts Argentina. Um, so just another reminder, the level in Commable is high, particularly um, at youth national team level. In the final few minutes of the podcast, because uh, we have three minutes left, quickly looking ahead to next week and the Toulon tournament, 28 players are currently out in Girona in Spain in the pre-tournament um, training camp. 
Uh, that will be cut to 23, not necessarily the 28. For example, David Martinez isn't in the 28, but he may get called up to the team. I don't think he will, but, you know, you don't have to be in this pre-module to get uh, called to the final cut. Uh, we're in a group with France who, like Venezuela, were finalists last year. They beat Venezuela, sadly. And we're in a group alongside Costa Rica and Saudi Arabia. The setup of the Toulon tournament means the three group winners of the, the three groups, A, B and C, advanced to the semis, and the best place second team. Venezuela being against France, who are technically hosts in the sense that the tournament is hosted in France every, every time uh, it takes place. We are in a tough group, but we do play France last. So we have Costa Rica and Saudi Arabia to get out of the way first. And two wins in those first two games would set us up nicely to, if not win the group, which will be a tough call against France, at least be the second play, best second place to get to the semi-finals. In the final minute and a half, Dominic, Toulon tournament, did you enjoy it last year? Looking forward to it again this year. What do you make of it? Yeah, absolutely. La the last Toulon tournament was 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 a really fun watch. We got to see a lot of these young players step up in an interesting way, play the kinds of teams you wouldn't have necessarily seen them play normally. You know, your, your France's, for example. Um, and and so I, I'm really glad that the national team is taking part again this year. I think it's a big opportunity for some of the same players as last tournament and some new to 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 show up to shine. There's some guys that are still you know finding their way in clubs in in Europe, for example, that. I think could very much use this platform to reinvigorate a little bit of the momentum of, of their careers or their playing careers. And mm -hmm. Segovia, uh, Danny Perez. Exactly. Huge examples there. And so I, I think it's a great opportunity and, and particularly because of how the U20 campaign went. I think it's a big opportunity for these guys to show up to play unique teams that are not necessarily going to be playing normally and continue to show, you know, the, the nation, the globe, the world, uh, the <laughs> continued development of of youth in Venezuelan football. I think that's what was really shown at the last tournament, and I think they have a great opportunity to do it again this year. Perfect. Before we get cut off by the Time Lords, let's cut the podcast short. Thank you very much for your time, Dominic, and I hope anyone listening has enjoyed this episode. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>